he will also listen <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so poetry as we have chosen to remember it now begins we are told in prayer i'm not very sure about that i'm sure there were things that we said in in the form of poetry that predate our desire to pray but let us assume that the longest lasting the longest lived poems that we have are generally prayers they are generally invocations now this would seem like an unfavorable beginning to half the audience perhaps who may not be very very uh, religious minded and maybe it is it would be seen as an auspicious beginning for many of those who are religiously minded and we live in this kind of world and i should point therefore to the first problem when we consider the utility value of poetry the task i have set myself today is to examine what use is a poem this is the multivalence of poetry multivalence has beauty right the beauty of ambiguity the beauty of liminal spaces the beauty of being in between so often in when one is talking to young people uh, the discussion begins about whether say um bob dylan is a poet because bob dylan's work often is allusive often uh, talks about issues um and has acquired a certain uh, a certain currency in the lives of children uh so poetry seems to exist in that space between music and prose it partakes of both it has elements of both in sense that prose is consists of words and so does poetry and poet music has rhythm and meter and scansion and so does poetry the poetry is not music poetry is not prose then what is poetry its ambivalence is the ambivalence then of terror so if you are looking for definitions then poetry is the kind of thing that terrifies you because anything that is ambivalent that it has multiple meanings or multiple resonances is something that is going to slip out of your grasp it's constantly reinventing itself it's constantly pushing edges So I remember there was a, a Marxist definition of poetry which said that it was lines on a page which did not reach the right hand margin. Okay, which is actually a very good definition of a, or, or the way actually a child looks at a poem. Right, when children first encounter poetry, they first. My belief is they first encounter poetry in the womb of their mothers, in the sense that. Uh, hearing is the first of the senses that the fetus develops and the music of the, the internal music of the mother's body is of course there is the beauty of the loop to loop to loop to loop to loop to the rhythmic beating of her heart which according to me is where i am the pentameter comes from stressed and stress stressed and stress stressed and stress okay but there's also the music of her of her bowel is the music of her stomach and of her gut all these are playing music into the into the into the ears of the child if the child has hearing of course and then this this way this uh, process comes you come out into the world and you carry this sound with you and sound is apparently we are told the last of the of the senses that goes right so we are confronted with the longest longest lived senses but since it begins with with prayer right since we have uh, we have the notion of poetry as prayer i thought i would be a good in indian boy and i would start with a prayer now one one of these two prayers is my own it is a little beat at the divine it's an attempt at praying um and you will see in it its own ambiguities i think and its ambivalences it's from my first book of poems called the silent prayer lord of the linear narrative show me the point at which i should begin stop me when i have said too much regulate my voice i boom too much and my whispers are shrill feed me words on those long slow afternoons allow me the grace of serendipity to find lost continents on my tongue give me the gift of silence and then 
set me adrift. The second prayer is a prayer that uh, turned up in my life in really odd circumstances. And in the odd circumstances of the making of this prayer is perhaps one of those accidents that poetry is so good at producing. Uh, I go to a gym in Mahim, the place where I live. And, um, you know, gyms in India tend to have a very, very raucous soundtrack playing in the background. So it's like really noisy music. Uh, what we call dinchak music, so dinchaka, 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 all the time in your, eye, in your ears, and that's supposed to encourage you. People think uh, whoever runs gyms thinks encourage you to do to work harder or run faster or whatever. Um, and one of the people who comes to the gym, the same, used to come to the same gym as I, was, the classical singer Neela Bhangar. Okay, she needed to be uh, getting her knees limber in order to be able to sit through two hours of music performances. And I remember asking her once, I said, you know, this music, doesn't it disturb you? She said, I don't think of it as music. I think of it as, uh, as catching up with what people are listening to. And I also think of it as percussion. And I live with it as percussion. So I thought that was another way of looking at something and reframing something. But what was interesting was my later, the music system failed. And in the failure of the music system, there was I, it was Neela on another treadmill. We gone two treadmills together like hamsters. And I turned to Neela and said, music has failed, why don't you sing? Now, this is not what you can say to, um, to classical musicians generally. They generally need a tanpura, they need a mridangam, they need the right time, they need the right space, they need to be sitting down, they need to be, they need to be, they need to be, which is fine. Uh, but Neela is not that kind of classical musician. Neela is more socialist at heart, I think. And so her, her belief is she can sing anything. And so she began to sing an ovi from uh, Muktabai, Mungi Udali Akashi. Now, Mungi Udali Akashi is uh, a beautiful poem, beautiful song that, uh, that Muktabai gave us in the 13th century. And it was fascinating because when a classical musician sings something, uh, they don't sing lines and move on. They will often explore the same line again and again and again. And this gives you the opportunity of allowing that line to spark off different thoughts in your head at different points in time. So I remember when it, it's Mungi Urali Akashi in a Gilele Suryashi. A ant flew into the sky and she swallowed the sun. And you're thinking, what exactly is the meaning here? What is exactly happening here? And then there's a moment when you think, perhaps this is... Uh, an eclipse. This is the big black jaws of an ant swallowing the sun, you know, collapsing it into darkness. And you're wondering, was there a solar eclipse in the 13th century that would have been visible from Maharashtra? That's one way of looking at it. But she's still singing in Udali Akashi, in Egerine Suryanshi. So you can again look at the lines and think, what if this is actually a little, little Mukta by as a child? kneeling and picking up an ant, a black ant, and then closing one eye and turning towards the sun and blotting out the sun with that optical illusion. And third time, again the line comes back. Again you're thinking, but what if this is, she swallowed the sun and swallowing the sun is what God must feel like. The arrival of God in your life. Sunlight and lava and a meltdown of gold inside you. An ant, a human being, as ant, swallowing the sun, experiencing God. What if this is that moment? And of course, when, the, when this got over, this singing got over, we both standing beside our treadmills, like breathless and sweaty. I turned to her and I said, that was beautiful. And I would like to read more of these, of these poems. Uh, where can I read them? And as we all do, I'm lazy. I don't, I wanted to read them in English. So I said, surely, surely they've been translated into English. And she said, no, they haven't. And I said, you're joking. And this, this is fabulous poetry. Why hasn't it been translated? And she said, and it hasn't. So I said what I say to hundreds of people across the country. And I've said it to Urdu poets. I've said it to lots of people. I said, bring together, uh, bring together 50 or 60 of the poems that, uh, that you like, and let's translate them together. And I thought, you know, Neela would go away and forget about it. And 
that would be the end of it. She nodded and uh, two weeks later, she rang the bell of my house and she came with a bunch of sheets of paper and she said, here are the 60 points that I think we should translate. And that's how the ant who swallowed the sun. That's this book. Please forgive the commercial breaks to show you book covers, but uh, uh, that's how this book got born. It got born in a gym, in a print mill. And therefore, one of the jobs of poetry is to infiltrate. It is to infiltrate spaces where you would not expect it to find it. You wouldn't expect to find it in a gym with a Dinchak soundtrack, but it was there. And this is where it began. And now I'm going to do uh, read a poem, a prayer, a meditation. Because Mukta Bhai, by the way, uh, if you think about bhakti, there's often this feeling that bhakti is all about throwing yourself at the feet of God and saying, oh, I love you, I love you, please save me, or whatever. You know, it's that kind of, we feel that, uh, that bhakti is generally supine with devotion in front of God. Mukta Bhai is not supine in front of anybody. Almost none of these women are. They, were, they are just like, they meet God face on. And Mukta Bhai is the P.S. Eliot of them. She and Sohira Bhai are just like outrageous women. They just, I, you know, you really would like to meet them and have coffee with them. They're just so interesting as human beings. So here's a poem uh, from uh, Mukta Bhai. It's called Sukhache Shevti Dukha Alele Kriti, which means after joy came, sorrow followed. And my translation is called Neela Bhagwat and I, we translated it as joy and sorrow. First came joy and on the morrow, hard on her heels, a visit from sorrow. Just as we settled down to grieving, sorrow announced that she was leaving. Joy and sorrow, what's the difference? Both are sisters born of ignorance. Muktai tells Sangya, self born the soul, standing like a banyan, aloof and whole. Those are the two prayers that I wanted to begin with. And having set up uh, this, let's just go on to say, let's begin with an answer, okay, into this question, what use is poetry of what? Let us begin with an answer. Poetry has no utilitarian value at all, right? Dilip Chitre asked famously, what is the work of a poem? It's an essay, interesting essay. It's still available in the public sphere. So I think anyone who wants can read it. And work itself is a multivalent word. It's an interesting word because work, at least as far as physics goes, is happens when a force acts on and produces displacement, okay? I used to teach this stuff to hapless school children, mathematics and physics for the first 15 years of my work life, from the age of 15 to the age of 30. If any of my students are here, I, I formally ask your forgiveness. <laughs> it was, I was simply facilitating this Marx mania that your parents, uh, that the neurosis of your parents have inflicted upon you. Anyway, so work, and this place. I need hardly tell you of the power. Jerry, Jerry, a little louder, please, if you don't mind. I'm sorry. Only a little bit louder. Okay. It's oh, is it better? Like, yeah, thoda son, a little louder. Okay. Uh, where did you start losing me? No, you. I haven't lost you. It's just that I want to hear you clearer. So okay. it's this, going this fabulously, better, right? fabulous, but I, just a little louder. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly go over what I said, just in case anybody didn't uh, miss it. I think, first of all, I started by, by talking about the origin of poetry in prayer. At least what we have saved of poetry has been saved because of prayer, right? So the oldest poems, whenever you look for poems that are older uh, than, say, 2,000 years, you will find that they are prayers. Now, this means poetry had one very clear function. It was a talisman against fear, right? Because the need for a God and the need for an intercession with God seemed to arise largely out of fear. So you spoke to the sun or you spoke to the moon or you spoke to the tides or the stars or whoever you were speaking to you spoke to them and asked if they would please 
just do your wishes. Send some rain, protect your crops, child. Uh, Jerry? Uh, we have lost him, unfortunately. I'm sorry is there, but I think there is some technical hitch on his side. I hope he can. Jerry, if you can hear us, yeah, he'll join back. You're on mute, Jerry. Yeah. You've muted yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. This was a bit of a glitch, I'm sorry. Or uh, the where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up, you know this poem. We've all probably recited it in, um, in class, in school, and we've loved it. It is, uh, our love is a remembered love. It is a love of when, when you first stumble on this poem in its reality, you think, yes, yes, yes. When you read it now, you realize that there is just one word that, that makes you a little uneasy. Into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake, which suggests that we, we will be able to achieve freedom in our sleep, that we will be able to wake one day perfectly and happily, and we will discover that freedom is ours. And we all know that if we sleep, we will lose freedoms. They will be taken away from us. And that eternal vigilance is the price for freedom. We know this. Okay, so I often think uh, when I'm saying that poem, and I often say that poem, and I often think about it, because it's a beautiful poem. I often think, daddy's not listening. <laughs> the father whom we have prayed, thousands and thousands of children have prayed to is not listening. We're going to have to do this freedom thing ourselves. And this freedom thing, is actually really something that each one of us is going to have to do. So each one of us is going to have to choose to make freedom available within the small sphere of influence that we have, right? So am I a teacher? Then is there freedom in my classroom? Is there freedom to dissent? Is there freedom to argue? Is there freedom to disagree? Am I a parent? Is there freedom in my family? Is there freedom to argue? Is there freedom to dissent? Am I a boss? Do I allow my workers, my colleagues, my, my co-workers, the people who report to me, do I allow them freedom? What kind of freedom do I allow? Okay. Very often we seek freedom in the large uh, and uh, you know, sort of abstract notion, whereas the the actual freedoms of that we are we can give other people we are reluctant to so when we are reluctant to give freedom we must understand that that is exactly the notion with which anyone who seeks to curtail our freedom approaches us and this is another gift of poetry the gift of empathy that if you are thinking about uh, about a moment in the life of somebody else, a life that you may never share, a life that you may never, you may never have, but you will still experience it vicariously through another person's feeling. So I was reading this poem uh, It's called it's a, a, a powerful poem called "Child Burial." by Paula Meehan. Child burial. Your coffin looked unreal, fancy as a wedding cake. 
I chose your grave clothes with care, your favorite stripy shirt, your blue cotton trousers. They smelled of wood smoke of October. Your own smell there too. I chose a ganzy of hand spun wool, warm and fleecy for you. It is so cold down in the dark. No light can reach you and teach you the paths of wild birds, the names of the flowers, the fishes, the creatures. Ignorant you must remain of the sun and its work. My lamb, my calf, my eaglet, my cub, my kid, my nestling, my suckling, my cold. I would spin time back, take you again within my womb, your amniotic lair, and further spin you back through nine waxing months to the split seeding moment you choose to be made flesh, world within me. I'd cancel the love feast, the hot night of your making. I would travel alone to a quiet, mossy place. You would spill from me into the earth, drop by drop, drop by bright red drop, child burial by Paul Amihan. So much involved there that I will, as a person, I think, not experience the death of a child, the death of a young child, menstruation, the magic of being able to make a human being within my body. All these things are close to me. But Paul Amihan throws open that door and welcomes me in. And welcomes me into a place and to a moment of great secrecy, of great intimacy, and of great vulnerability. This, I think, is the central um, problem for poets. Okay? Um, poetry requires you to dare to be vulnerable. It requires you to take off your clothes and literally be naked in public. Uh, it requires you to say, I am human and I am much, much less than human. So when you read something like, uh, you know, um, My Last Duchess by Robert Browning or Frali Polippi, okay, which are poems of great rage, where there are people who, are, who have suffered in some way and who have been tormented and twisted, uh, you discover who you do not want to be. You discover who you do, who, what the antithesis of humanity is. And there is the poem that takes you slightly above yourself, takes you to a, a much greater place. And it's very odd how this works, okay? So here I was, um, I went to an SSC medium school. Uh, we did very little Shakespeare. Um, and uh, we did one, I think one scene, not even an act, but a scene from As You Like It, uh, you know, not, good, uh, not even a very good scene that I remember, as I remembered it, but that's what we did. And then I went to college and, you know, discovered that other people who were in the ICSC board had studied a whole play of Shakespeare, sometimes two or three plays, and studied them with great intensity and great, with great depth. So I decided that I would read the whole of Shakespeare over a uh, summer's weekend, a uh, summer's break, and I sat down to read it and found it awfully boring. I just was lugging my way through it, thinking I have to do this because, you know, this seems to be part of what one does to be educated, to be, to be, to be sophisticated, to be a man of letters, as I aspired to be. And this is another job that poetry does. Poetry gives us sophistication. I'll come back to that later. Um, and then my mother saved me almost accidentally. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading Shakespeare. She said, don't be silly. No one reads Shakespeare. You read Shakespeare aloud. That's how you discover him. And suddenly we, I was reading him aloud. And then the family read with me. We all took parts. And, you know, we did plays. And it was great fun. I mean, suddenly it, became, it came alive. And I actually was laughing and enjoying it. But I remember reading Hamlet. And there's a se uh, sequence, a uh, uh, short speech in Hamlet given by Polonius, okay, to thine own, it ends with those famous lines, to thine own self be true, 
and it follows as the night the day. Thou canst not be false to any man. And the whole of the speech, according to me, seemed to be full of very good advice. Really the kind of advice of a young man should hear from his father. And then at some point, I don't know, I was in class in, in Elphinstone College. Hamlet came up, the Polonius speech was mentioned, and the teacher said that this was a series of cliches. This was something that Shakespeare had put into the mouth of Polonius because Polonius is a bumbling old fool. And so Shakespeare gave him these, these lines, you know, neither a borrower nor a lender be, you know, for the loan loses both itself and friend. I just think, I thought they were fabulous lines and I thought they were good advice. And I was being told that they were not. So this is where the multivalence of poetry can get you. Likewise, uh, I don't know if uh, many people in the audience will have seen Four Weddings and a Funeral, um, famous film with Hugh Grant and various other people. And halfway through that, uh, through this film, uh, there's a bereavement. So there's a young uh, a gay couple and uh, the older partner dies. And the young man standing by the grave of his, of his uh, dead lover proceeds to read a poem, stop with all the clocks, turn off the, you know, that one, uh, the Auden poem. Now the Auden poem was written as a parody. Okay? So it's written as a parody of all the things that dictatorships generally try to do when the dictator dies, okay? And so it was a mockery of a poem. It was not supposed to be like a serious poem. It was a joke. Okay? But read by this young, beautiful actor, with a perfect British accent in the middle of this lovely film, which was celebrating so much, celebrating as much uh, cool Britannia as it was celebrating uh, everything else. Britishness, it was, that was what it was about. And Anglophiles just like fell in love again. Um, in the middle of this film, the, the poem was no longer a parody. It was a heartfelt scream of pain. And now when I, uh, when I bought Do Not Go Gentle to That Kind Night and other poems for funerals, which is brought out by Blood Axe, this poem appears there as well. So obviously everybody knew that this was, this Auden poem was, was a parody, but it has now been accepted as not being a parody, as being something that you can say uh, without causing muffled laughter at a great time. That's how poetry works. It's not going to do what you think it's going to do. It's going to go out and do something else. Why do you think it is so difficult to tell what the work of poetry is? So let's just look at it, come at it from another point of view. Let's come at it from this point of view. This point of view that says uh, reality is different for all of us. Because each one of us brings a unique perspective to the table. So if I walk into a room and look at the at a painting on the wall and say master. Another person walks into the room, looks at a painting on the wall and says, my three-year-old could do this. A third person walks into the wall and says, depressing. Which of these three evaluations of the painting is true? All three. Move on. Now, of course, uh, English literature teachers and other people who have an investment in these things will talk about endless subjectivity and subjectivity being a dangerous thing. It is if you are trying to build a canon. It is if you are trying to define a poem. It is if, even if you are trying to define the work of a poem as I am doing today, right? Then these things become difficult. But if you simply allow yourself to go with the flow, and the flow is this, mother nature did not create, did not use a cookie cutter. She created individual people and individual people bring their individual sensitivities to any experience, including the experience of poetry. So now that means that poetry reminds us of our uniqueness. Poetry reminds us that we are extremely, I'm sorry. Sorry, I knocked. Okay. 
I'm sorry, I knocked myself off my own pedestal. <laughs> uh, it reminds us of our uniqueness and it reminds us of our ordinariness and our everydayness as well. So one of the, uh, so I'm going to read you a poem from the Ahomia. By the way, this is uh, from these my words, uh, the Penguin Book of Indian Poetry, edited by Eunice de Sousa and Melanie Silgado, a great book for anyone who's looking to reconnect to poetry because it has poems from very many different like, Indian languages, you know, including uh, Ahomia. So this is Nilamoni Fukan. Poetry is for those who wouldn't read it. Poetry is for those who wouldn't read it. A poet has stated, poetry is for those who wouldn't read it, for the wounds in their hearts, for their fingers where thorns are embedded, for the anguish and the joy of the living and the dead, for the outcry that trundles down the road day and night, for the desert sun, for the meaning of death, for the vacuity of living, for the dark stones cursed by ruins, for the red patch between the lusty lips of maidens, for the yellow butterflies with wings spread on barbed wires, for the insects, the snails and the moss, for the bird flying lonely down the afternoon sky, for the anxiety in fire and water, for the mothers of 500 million sick and starving children, for each stilled moment, for the world that keeps turning, for one kiss from you, that the man of dust will become dust again for that old saying. Um, it is, therefore the poem is a rallying point as well. It's a point of, of, that creates um, the, the revolution, literally. There has been very, there have been very few revolutions that have not had an anthem, that have not had a song at the heart of them. Sometimes, so I'd like to just read Gopal Honalgere's poem, How to Tame a New Pair of Chappals. How to Tame a New Pair of Chappals. Don't keep them together. Don't allow them to talk to each other. They may form a trade union. Don't leave them anytime near a wall clock, law books, calendar, national flag, Gandhi's portrait or newspaper. They may come to know about Independence Day, Satyagraha, holidays, working hours, minimum wages and corruption. Don't take them to your temple. They may at once come to know that you are weak, your God is false and start biting you. Don't take them any time close to your dining room. They may ask for food or cast their eye, evil eyes on your sumptuous dinner. First use them only for short walks, then gradually increase the distance. They should never know the amount of work they have to do. Pull their tight straps loose. Let them feel happy. They are growing bigger. Smear some old oil on the rough straps. Let them feel they are anointed. Now they are good subdued laborers, ready to work overtime for your fat feet. I think someone's uh, uh, someone's voice is coming through. Could you please uh, mute yourself? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, <clears throat> I'm muting Surashmi, ma'am. But I think accidentally she's again unmuting herself. Yeah. And also there's somebody called Q Kong who's joining. Can you please uh, mute that person as well? I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, please. No. Uh, Okay, uh, are we good to go? Yes, please. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think one of the, uh, one, another function of poetry, which uh, we tend to ignore generally, is 
the function of poems in the everyday, in the ordinary moment. The fact that poetry is an infiltrator and turns up everywhere. So here is A.K. Ramanujan's wonderful poem, Routine Day Sonnet. For me, a perfectly ordinary day at the office, only a red lorry past the window or two, a sailor with a chest tattoo, a walk before dark with my daughter to mark, another cross on the pap papaya tree, dinner, coffee, bedtime story of dog, bone and shadow, a bullock cart in an Eskimo dream, but I wake with a start to hear my wife cry her heart out as if from a crater in hell. She hates me. I hate her. I'm a filthy rat and a satyr. <laughs> Lovely poem by A.K. Ramanujan. I think um, the use of poetry is often spoken of as giving witness. But poetry, poetry is an unreliable witness. But then we are all, I'm told now, unreliable witnesses. We're going to have to live with the fact that Apparently, when you make a memory, you make a protein in your brain. And each time you go back to that memory, the protein is remade and the brain is remade. It means that each time you think you are remembering, you're actually remembering to remember and, to, and therefore you are changing the memory. So therefore, of course, you, we invented other devices because we were uncertain about our own ability to remember. So we invented the photograph first. And then we discovered that the photograph could also be tricky, could be tricky. I think uh, Milan Kundera proved that beautifully when he talks about the erasure of the person, but only the hat left behind. Um, you know, then comes uh, the video recording. So now we have made a video recording of this, and this video recording is supposed will be the, the memory of this event. Sure. Except that somebody we can use artificial intelligence to remake this video and allow us to say any to put anything into my mouth. Any one of us is now up for grabs. So reality is, is becoming tremulous. It is becoming even more tremulous than it was instead of solidifying, instead of like concretizing, which is what almost all the things that we wanted to do in order to trap memory. We invented photography to hold on to things. We invented uh, the uh, video dev recording devices to hold on to moments, to keep them fixed in a certain way. And our artificial intelligence will come and tamper with that as well. So you have to live with negotiation. Because a poem, to be a poem, must hold a truth. Because a truth, to be a truth, must be crystalline. Because crystal is multifaceted and makes for a bad bed companion, the poet suffers from the question. What use are you? And in fact, the question is often translated as who are you and what are your poems about? And so the last poem that I will read today before we open for questions will be a poem called My Poems. It's by Jerry Pinto again. My poems, my poems are about many things. My poems are about magic. My poems are about music. My poems are about poetry festivals. My poems are written for people like you. My poems take shortcuts. My poems write slipstreams. My poems take the path of least resistance. My poems are needy. My poems need you to like them. My poems want you to remember them. My poems demand that you should memorize them. My poems want prizes. My poems want to be on syllabi and curricula. My poems want to be translated into Hindi, Marathi, Tamil, Telugu, Gujarati, Sanskrit, German, French, Italian, Polish, Afrikaans, and American. My poems want diplomatic immunity. My poems want visa and arrival. My poems want to be burned in public, but only by men in the right kind of clothes. My poem want, poems want exclusion from the canon and recovery by Pound and Eliot and Orushti. My poems want to be epigraphs to other poems. My poems want to be photographs of busty blondes with smooth, silky, those things. My poems challenge virtual reality. My poems are live headlines and red bottom lines. My poems want you to sit up and pay attention and pin drop silence or they'll come and get you. My poems are torn from the gut and mind in the amygdala. My poems are drenched from the heart and filed in the sigmoid colon. My poems are seeds planted in your head. They'll sprout when you're dead. 
My poems are viruses, they self-replicate, they do that parthenogenesis thing. My poems are programs, they erase your hard disk and implode. My poems are dangerous, they can only be bought by adults who have certificates of illiteracy that make them immune. My poems are wanted by Interpol. My poems are tracked by the FBI. My poems are protected by Amnesty International. Thank God I am nothing like my poems. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jerry, your camera is down. Yeah. Thank God that you're nothing like your poems. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Are there any questions? We're just, just taking time to sink everything in. I mean, it's just sinking in still. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, may I ask a question? Ask yeah. 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 Could I ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. This is Supant Bhattacharya from Nagpur. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, big fan of yours. I've read everything you have written, including your translations. And um, uh, thank you so much for all the wonderful work that uh, you've written for us. So, one question. Uh, how far does, in poetry especially, uh, language uh, make uh, your emotions or your thoughts? How far do words and language make them opaque or transparent? I think, uh, you know, one of the, the aim of every poet would be uh, for transparency. Uh, one would like to imagine that words are transparent and words are, uh, are willing workers. Mm -hmm. But actually, words are not, okay? Because uh, I think uh, we would be imagining a quite different world if we could imagine into being a language that would be non-polysemic, that would have only one meaning, and that meaning would be accepted by everybody. And that would, that would just solve everything. Unfortunately, no. it's not going to happen. You, however simple your word, however simple and however clear your expressiveness, right? Uh, even that you consider that Mungi Urali Akashi in the Suryanshi poem. So uh, later through in the course of that poem, um, Muktabai talks about your about the about the fact that the that she says, uh, then you begin to see that this poem is, a, let me read it to you. The poem is a series of miracles, of strange things that happen because of God. Okay? So, Mungi Udakta, the ant flew into the sky, she swallowed the sun, is just the first of the miracles that happens. Now, let's go on with that. Uh, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, an ant flew into the sky, she swallowed the sun. That wasn't the only wonder. The baron gave birth to a son. And now, as soon as I read this, this line, I thought, uh, oh dear, can't it be a child? Can't we just say child? Uh, so I went to my guru in these in translation matters, Shanta Gokhale, and I said, uh, you know, Shanta, I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit worried by the fact that Muktabai says um, son. I wish she'd said child because that's so much nicer that, you know, for a barren woman to give, I mean, the word barren itself has so many problems, but right. anyway, dealing yeah. with all this. And Shanta said, Mukta, what did Muktabai say? So I said, she says son, right? Uh, and this is at the end of the day, what has been said and where you will stay. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, but I still would like to, I'd like to take some hand in this and say child. And then Muktabai yeah. spoke to me across centuries and said, in your tradition, Jerry, look at the barren women of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Does any one of them give birth to a daughter or do they give birth to sons? Mm -hmm. And yeah. inevitably, when there is someone who is aged and has 
you know, she's 80 years old, she's never had a child, and God confers a blessing on her, that blessing is a boy child. So Mukta Bhai was asking me, why are you imposing this on me? Why are you imposing your value system, mm -hmm. your beliefs on me? This is my poem. You want to go out and write a poem about uh, great miracles that happen and say bad, a, bad, a woman who uh, at 80 gave birth to a girl child and I'll be fine with that. But at, when you're working with my poem, you will do it what I what I need you to do. Right? Right. So I decided that I would stay with the bad and give, the bad and give birth to a son, though I don't like both ideas, but I do like Muktabai herself, and I like the poetry, and I like the music. So, one, when someone is reading, when most people read that, they had no problems with it. I have not had one person, and many of my friends are feminists, many of my friends are, are, um, are acutely sensitive to that reading, that kind of reading, have come back and said, hey, that was such a letdown. So, um, now, my reading of it made me worry, but nobody else is did. So now I'm fine with it. I just accept it. And that's the, this is the lesson that we learn as creative people, right? Uh, I think it was very beautifully put by a painter called Philip Guston. In, uh, he lived in America. He was a Frenchman. Uh, but he said one day when uh, he was being interviewed on TV, he said, when I'm painting, when I begin painting, everyone is in the room with me. Uh, the great masters are there, Leonardo da Vinci is there, Raffaello, Michelangelo, they're all there. My contemporaries are there, Picasso is there, you know, Van Gogh is there, they're all there. The gallerists are there, the critics are there, my family is there, my buyers are there, they all with me. Mm -hmm. Students start painting. And then one by one, they begin to leave. And finally, I am alone with my painting. And then I must leave. And I used to think, my God, that is that is so beautiful and so true. Because beautiful. once you finish a work of art, you must place some st space between it and you. But recently, I've been thinking. Now we need. I need to add something to Mr. Guston's uh, creation. That room is empty. That room is empty when Mr. Guston has left, but it begins to fill up again. One by one, people walk into the room, those gallerists, those critics, the family, the friends, they walk into the room. And by walking into the room, they make that into an artwork. It is not an artwork if the painter has just finished it and walked away. It is an artwork when people come in and begin a conversation with begin to talk to it and understand it and interpret it or just think about it or let it seep into them, drip into them change them in some way. A poem is exactly the same thing. A poem is not a poem until someone reads it and makes it a poem. So therefore, now, how that poem becomes a poem is completely up to each reader. Each reader's subjectivity changes the poem slightly and makes it different. So you, know, you begin to accept that transparency as far as a word goes, maybe, uh, maybe an ideal, but as far as poetry goes, you can only hope for translucency. You can hope that some light will pass through the poem and that the refraction that happens will be, if not minimized, then will at least be beautiful and will be subject to interpretation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no so just a related question. The fact that you uh, have, uh, speak uh, and uh, use so many languages so well. Does it affect you when you are writing an original poem, say in English? Uh, I, you know, I think um, almost everything that uh, that we do uh, that has any relationship to language affects us. So even uh, the ordinary conversations of the day will seep into the into one's bloodstream and a uh, 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 connect with other languages. In some ways, I, I often speak of India as, you know, we talk of ourselves, often we speak of ourselves easily as bilingual or trilingual or multilingual, or I spoke five languages or whatever. And it is true. Uh, the average Indian does speak fairly. I mean, I'm sure you speak a good amount of Marathi, a good amount of Hindi, and a good amount of English. So that makes you trilingual already. Yeah. But we tend to use one language in a sacred manner. 
and we tend to use the other languages as in order to drive an agenda. So if you are uh, primarily, say, English speaking and thinking as I am, then your relationship with other languages becomes agenda based. So you use Hindi, you use Marathi, you use Konkani, but Konkani to your grandparents because they are from Goa, or Marathi to your neighbors because they are Maharashtrians, Hindi to your friends because they they are comfortable in Hindi, that sort of thing. But this is crossing from the linguistic islands at low tide, going quickly across and running back to connect with another language really and thoroughly, to live, to go there on a pilgrimage, to come back therefore with with Prashant is, I think, translation. That's when you go with the intention. You're no longer now exploiting the language for what it can do for you. You're you're asking the language for a vardhan, asking the language for a boon. And that boon is enriching, variegate me, change change my world into a multicolor world. Let me be stained by Marathi. Let me be be drenched with Hindi. Let me enjoy and savor Konkani in my tongue. These are the intentions when you enjoy poetry in that language, when you read the literature of that language, when you translate. That becomes a real and vibrant connection. So I feel we are, uh, so many of us, like a, a man at a buffet with a hundred dishes that he could try. And we go and eat the same dish every day. Mm-hmm. Every day. So I was like that for the first 30 years of my life. I went to the buffet and I ate English. I just kept on eating English. And then one day it occurred to me that I'm here. And because of my, the education system, I have been given the gift of Hindi and Marathi. I can read those. Why don't I start? And I discovered that both Marathi and Hindi books are not expensive. They're easily available. I got them, started reading them. And 20 years later, I feel I have a rich and varied diet, right? So I have a Hindi book on my table. I have a Marathi book. I have a company book. I have book poetry in several languages. And I read a poem a day in every one of the languages that I can read in. And I think I'm the richer for it. Now, does the poetry show that? That the critics will have to say. I can't say it for myself. I would love to believe that my my poetry shows the linguistic variants and my, uh, you know, my deep, but that would be like awful to say. I just know that my life is for, for uh, having, uh, for having engaged with these languages in more than just an agenda-based way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that analogy of diet. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Sindran has raised her hand from and then we have another. Uh, uh, ma'am, uh, if, it, if sir doesn't, doesn't mind, we have a question on Zoom. Could we take it first and then Sindhan and Adam could ask her? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, so, sir, uh, Nidha Mishra wants to know uh, why must poetry be so significant to give meaning to our mediocre life? Uh, is it because of the charming words that we desire to hear? Okay, and I, you know, no poem is ever going to be as rich as a life. <laughs> this is true. I think, I really actually believe that a poem is, uh, is a very small fragment of life. Life is, is much richer, much more beautiful than any poem is. Uh, so I think what you should, what, uh, Uh, What poems do for us is they give us another way of looking at ordinariness, right? So you take ordinariness and and you can blow it up, okay? Uh, You can look at just the average everyday thing and make it something spectacular and beautiful, right? And I think that's what poetry can do for us. So the question is not is, uh, is... what is the attraction of poetry? I think the attraction of poetry in most cases is poetry. It's, uh, damn, here's the, the, the thing. Uh, I think most poets are very, very jealous of musicians, especially uh, people who play a musical instrument. Because if you play a musical instrument well, right, everyone understands you. Everyone gets it. Your virtuosity is just out there, immediate, everyone knows that you are so uh, so good at this. Like whether you're playing the violin or you're playing the mridangam, it doesn't matter. 
and for poetry you need language no? so if uh, if tomorrow a czech poet is reading i'm going to listen to the sound of the of the of the language but i won't understand much or a polish poet or a french poet or, there's so many languages that we don't know enough of to be able to understand the poetry so poetry tends to limp behind these behind music i think so uh, if there is anything that adorns life and makes it much better than the visual arts plastic arts music they have in any way an advantage over poetry 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 is fundamental fundamentally about language and therefore poetry is fundamentally about poetry if you love poetry you love poetry if you don't love poetry i can't persuade you to love it because i can i can tell you why it would help you would make you a better person i would think but i can't i can't actually say um, that poetry you know improves your life or makes your life better yeah i'm um, sorry there was another question uh, thank you sir simran um, ma'am you could go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask the question sure uh, yeah Uh, hello, sir. I am uh, Simran Shrivastav, and I am an English literature student, and I like to write as well. So I wanted to ask, in uh, like terms of poetry, I think it's uh, very important to write in a way uh, that evokes some emotions in the reader. So, like, uh, do you have any suggestions for how I can do that? Okay. Uh, are you saying that you'd like? I see. Um... you have to give up the idea that you can control what the reader is going to feel right the reader is going to take the poem and dance on it the reader is going to take the poem and eat it and dissolve it and digest it and it will be completely in it will not be anything like you imagined it will be so give up the idea of of working with uh um, what i'd like the uh, the poet uh, the the reader to feel but if you want to write poetry for whatever reason you want to write poetry then here's the first many steps okay many 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 steps the first is i would say um read a lot of poetry um uh, read a lot of poetry uh please buy books of poetry like okay don't you can read on the internet but uh, often you will find that there are no gatekeepers so there are lots of people who throw put a poem on the internet and those will be of mixed quality right so when you are consider this when you are listening to music you would like to listen to a maestro singing or playing or you know or a maestra singing or playing and you because you want to see what is the best possible in this genre or uh, you won't listen to your next door neighbor or you won't go to your next door neighbor for classes because she hums a little so read and buy books of poetry read lots of poetry okay read then i would say orden and spender used to say this and i think it's interesting and important learn poetry by heart okay learn lines of poetry by heart learn lots and lots of poetry by heart. i used to have this uh, this challenge for myself which is i would walk from nariman point up to uh, chopati and up to alkeshwar reciting a poem all different poems all the way and see if i could last out up to there by the end by the end i have to say i was doing nursery rhymes and stuff as well but i still i still think it is a very important thing to do the third read poetry aloud okay so much of the poetry that i see when i see this poetry i see that it is poems that have been conceived on paper and have been trapped on paper and left to die on paper because they have not been tested in your vocal cords and not been tested out in in the open i find that when i read a poem okay when i write a poem i use i i write by hand this doesn't mean you have to write by hand it just means that i write by hand because i feel that carnal connectedness between pen and ink and paper is very important to me that's how i like to make poetry i like to make poetry with ink and blot and splotch and paper and scrape of pencil against paper or pen against paper that's how i like to make poetry you can do it on on pixels i have no nothing against it but first is that uh writing okay the second stage for me is reading it aloud 
and seeing whether the music that I imagined I heard in my head is actually there on the paper and it so often is not. And the third thing that I do is then type it out, put it in the computer and immediately the line lengths change because the line lengths when you're writing uh, with your handwriting are just different from the line lengths on the, on, on you know, Times New Roman font 10. <laughs> What happened to my poem? Why does it look so different? And the look of the poem also then becomes part of it because now you're presenting it to an audience who will probably not read it aloud on the first note. They'll just read it on the page. So you're, you're looking at the poem there. Finally, you give it time. Okay, so I leave a poem for at least three or four months before I, I inflict it on anybody else. And... Uh, then I come back to it after three or four months and I read it and I see, because by then the first fervor has gone. The first great connection between you and the poem where you love it because it's yours and how great a poem it is. And finally a poem came after so long and my God, it's perfect. That has faded. Now you can come to the poem and say, okay, if this were a poem by somebody else, would I think it's a good poem? You have to examine it that way. And then you say to yourself, yeah, okay perhaps working or no, not working. So there are various stages that you go through. And finally, it would really help if you put together a group of people. Like, I mean, you know, uh, from, if you are in a literature class, set up a poetry. We had a poetry circle in Bombay. Uh, Ranjit Hoskote, Arundhati Subramaniam, Raj Rao, Menka Shibhasani, I, uh, we were all, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the young people <laughs> Now we're all in our fifties, but at that time we were young people. But we had great mentors, Mr. Ezekiel, Adil Jasawala, um, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra would drop by from time to time, and they would uh, they would die in hell. But we created a space in the poetry circle where listening was important. Okay, where you listen to a poem and you gave feedback on the poem, and people went away with that feedback, and and you know, and Okay, the first thing that, the most important thing that Poetry Circle did was there is a great nakedness about reading your poem the first time in public. There is a terrible feeling that I should not be doing this. I, I don't know why, I, I, I don't want to do this. Okay, but when you're doing it in a safe space with people who all understand and who will hold you in that space and be sympathetic and supportive, where poetry is important, where the placement of a comma is important, where capital letters or the lack of them is important. Everyone is focused on the poem. No one is asking questions like, how are you going to make money on poetry? Or who is going to publish this book? It's not important. Right now, we're just talking about the poem. That kind of space we created for each other. And the 10, 15 of us who appeared, first we met every week, then we met every fortnight to ascend. We met every month after 10 years. It closed down because you know, we all had much to do. And a young person came up to me and said, hey, uh, can we do? Can I do poetry circles? And I said, of course you can. It's an open model. All you have to do is find a place. Sit together, bring poems, bring copies of the poems. Everybody reads the poem together. Read the poem. Consider it. Actually look at the poem. Look at the structure of the poem. Look at metaphor. Look at meaning. Look at, look at syntax. Look at grammar. Look at everything about the poem. Focus as well. It's really the most important thing in the world. Take concentrate the complement of concentrated attention to the poem and you have in that room the magic of the hive mind you have space created where people can understand and, and, and help each other so she was very excited and she went away and she said and then I, as she was going I said listen if you ever set this up please tell me I'd like to come and read a poem sometime it's okay and they were all very excited and whatnot. And then about six months later, I met her and I said, how's it going? How's the poetry circle going? And she said, we closed down. I said, what? what happened? And she said, you know, people would read their poems and leave. They wouldn't stay to listen to other people's poems. And this, I think, is what social media is doing to us. We want to broadcast, but we don't want to listen. Right? So listening as an active part of poetry making, consuming poetry, eating it, eat poems, Chew chillables, make them part of you. Let them run down your stomach. Soak in poetry. Don't buy that coffee. Buy a book of poetry. On secondhand book sales, shops. Buy poetry from bookshops. Read it aloud before you go to sleep. Read a poem before you sleep. Make poetry. Okay. And bless you. <laughs>
good luck neha uh, thank you so much thank you sir neha there is a question couple of questions go on neha. yes ma'am i am reading them uh, on youtube live sir there are a couple of questions the first one is uh, angst and toxicity of modern life is the source of modern writers uh, with life so full of convolution is it also necessary to always hold the mirror to life's reality लास्ट इ If I ask the young people here, when did you go to the library, the college library, and take a book of poems free from the college library to read, they probably say not in the last year. Or I took it because it was my set text. It was set for by the syllabus, and therefore you took it. So poetry seems unnecessary until it becomes the only thing that will hold you. Right. when your heart breaks you turn to poetry when 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 there is a betrayal in your life you turn to poetry when there is there is there is celebration you turn to poetry but otherwise poetry is not important so most people walk away from poetry but poetry doesn't walk away from them poetry follows you poetry is already inside you it's waiting it's just waiting for you to come back it's waiting for you to be friends with it again it's waiting for you to do do something nice like taking a risk on a book of poetry 300 bucks yeah 200 rupees or on second hand stalls 50 rupees right throw it away take a book of poems home dip it in read it in the night curl up in the night read a poem before you go to sleep and as for reflecting reality reality has hundreds of mirrors the tv is a mirror the the newspaper is a mirror and each of these mirrors says to you i am the real reflection of reality and we know that these are not real reflections we know this right so what is real what it can poetry be that reflection poetry is a refraction of reality it passes through the Uh, Jerry, you've muted yourself. Srija, can you unmute Jerry, please? Yes, ma'am. Just a second. Ah, uh. you were on mute, Jerry, and you still are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as for I don't know where I have got muted, but let me say this: I do not believe that any one thing is a mirror of reality. But reality has to be. Uh, we have to take what we can and combine it and form our own reality. But one thing that we must do in humility is to know that when we do that, the prism of the self. Look, for me, I'm a liberal. I'm a secular person. I'm a Roman Catholic. Those are my prisms. I must acknowledge these as my prisms and say that when I look at reality, these are the prisms that I use to filter reality and, and construct it for myself. And therefore, this is my reality, which may not be anybody else's. I must respect the fact that you have different prisms, and therefore, you will find a different reality on yourself. This is where the toxicity will cease. If I can say, "Oh, is that what you think?" It's not what I think. Okay, and can I tell you what I think? And you can say, you know, Jerry, you're a Roman Catholic, born, uh, you know, from Bombay. That is why I'm a liberal, and that's why you think the way you think. And I say, yes, interesting. And you are X, Y, and Z, and that's why you think why you think. Is that so? And if we can both agree, we can both agree that neither of us has a has you know like a, a take on the truth that is going to be bigger than all of us. then we can manage to live together because we have a big reality in india no 
1,537 languages and counting, said Dr. Ganesh Tekri. Now that's 1,537 different ways of, of prisms for reality, right? Each language produces a prism that is different. So this either can be a source of great joy and a challenge to us, or it can be a part, pronoun, why do we have to have this mess? Why can't we all just speak one language? Don't be silly. Really? Really? You want to give it to me? This kind yeah. of richness? Yeah? <laughs> Same. Yeah, anybody with a question? Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Dharma Bikari, uh, how so long do I have? Or uh, uh, we do have a few more questions, Jerry, if you don't mind. I'm fine, but how long? I mean, this for audience has to go. Some people have to cook lunch, dinner. Some people have to uh, have to buy stuff. Okay, but, <laughs> but okay. I'm sure this is just uh, this is just once in a lifetime opportunity they have to talk to you. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so Come we'll on. continue a little bit if you don't mind. No, no, no. Eight new messages yeah. on uh, Zoom itself. So okay, yeah. go for so it. Today, What's uh, next? We know whether. Uh, any other uh, questions that you can see? I can see a raised hand. Simran Srivastava. Yeah. Uh, Simran huh. There's a Kartika's a question, I think. Yeah? Yes, ma'am. Uh, before that, ma'am, Anne has asked a question on okay. Zoom as well. Okay. Uh, sir, how does poetry exist in the contemporary epoch marked by the sense of disillusionment and disenchantment, particularly after the endemic? Uh, both writing and reading poetry, she says, they become privileged, uh, a privilege that feels out of reach. Uh, so she wants to know your thoughts on this. You know, today, for instance, there was um, a meeting for Gadar, because he's just passed away. Uh, there was a meeting for Gadar that I would have liked to attend it. Uh, and Gadar is uh, from a very unprivileged background. Um, Never make the mistake of confusing poetry and privilege. Poetry is, is available to everybody, okay? And people, everybody is using poetry. So it's, it's okay. I think what you're thinking is English poetry is a privilege. Okay, and that it is. English is a privilege. English is a terrible privilege. And it is a terrible sort of for everybody in this country. Whether you can or cannot speak English is really a defined. You can talk the most unnatural nonsense in English and people will think that you are that you're you're extremely wise, and you can say uh, very very intelligent things in non-English Indian languages, and people will may discount you. Right? We know this. So English is a language of privilege. It's a killer language. It's a X, Y, and Z. But what do you do if this language is your lover? What do you do if this language is in your heart and your soul? What do you do? There's nothing you can do except accept it and live with it. So for me, the pandemic. Uh, threw up an opportunity. See, the pandemic threw us all back on ourselves, right? We were all confronted with how inadequate the self was. Right? Because we suddenly the whole world shrank into a very small uh, quarter, right? I, I live in a one-bedroom hall kitchen in, in uh, Mumbai. Uh, I share the space with my sister. We lived together for those two years. I thank God for poetry. I thank the powers that be for poetry because that opened my world out. Every time I opened a book, I was in another universe, another space. So for me, uh, poetry was the escape route through the pandemic. I read quantities of poems. I read poems again and again. I, read, I And there was, this, there was time. We weren't commuting. Okay, It was magical at some it was horrible at some level and the, and the news was 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 frightening and you know people were walking home and there was so much that was happening but we i escaped into poems from time to time i escaped into poems and that's another use of poetry for the poem as an escape route sometimes the escape route ends up in your heart and you find yourself in your heart you find yourself in your darkest spot. But sometimes you're among the stars. So for many people, the pandemic was a moment when they encountered poetry again, or they were thrown back on poetry, or they started writing poetry. So the pandemic as an event has had many uses for, for all of us. 
and many terrible things happened as well. This is not to be discounted. Yeah. Question. Uh, thank you, sir. Hmm. Uh, there's one more on Zoom, and after that, we'll take uh, Shelly Naran's uh, question. She uh, raised uh, sure. her hand. Uh, Kartika wants to know uh, what is that one historical context or influential work that has ever moved you or is reflected in any of your work? You know, it is very difficult to say. I think, uh, I think almost we are we are stains. We are you know, every poet, I think, is a wall with many stains on it. Okay. Uh, so I would say um, very early readings of the Bible are influential in my work. I think uh, very often uh, all my predecessors, Adil, Jasawala, Nisim Ezekiel, oh, Kamla Das, Kamla Das, very important in my work. Uh, my colleagues, they, they're very different from me, Arundhati Subramaniam and, and Ranjit Horskote, um, Mustansir Dalvi. Uh, they're very uh, different poets, but their voices are very strong in my ears. I can hear them. When I read a poem by any of them, I can hear their voice and I know exactly how they'd say it. So when I read, if I read their poems, I do their knuckle. And I'm thinking, no, 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 you, you'll be a bad imitator. Just do the poem the way that it, but it's the voice keeps coming through. So it's, I think, you know, we are uh, a palimpsest in the sense that we have levels and layers and levels and layers. And the further you dig down, the more odd the, the layers come. And then suddenly there are things like, uh, you know, some say the world will end in fire. Some say nice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. Robert Frost? What? Really? Oh, yeah, Robert Frost. Why not? I mean, just... Everybody's inside your head. Everyone whom you've read. That's why I said my poems are, uh, are viruses. They will erase your heart drive. My poems are set to explode. Every poem that you read goes in there somewhere. You have to be very careful what you read, or you have to be careless. You have to be brave. You have to throw yourself open, like fling open the windows and doors. Let all the poetry flood in. See what happens. That sort of feeling, right? That's my, my attitude. Like I want to know. I will read. I will read a poem. I will read another poem. To this agreeing to do this was because hey, I can get quote like I'm going to do some work. I told everybody I have to deliver the Kamla Narayan Memorial Lecture. I have to go and look at my poetry books. <laughs> Two poems to read. I got to read all like lots and lots of poetry books again. And I got to say it was it was you know otherwise you're just reading poetry there sitting in a corner. What use is that to the world? You no, know, who cares what use it is to the world? Really, who cares? I'll tell you what it is. It is your use to me. This is what I do. This is what I make. Okay. And in the making of it, I discover who I am. And for me, that is enough. That is more than enough. Because discovering who you am eventually yeah, is, is the reason why we are here. Why would we be here if you are just supposed to live, you know, sort of like eat, sleep, uh, defecate, wake up lives? Why would we be given this gift of self-consciousness? Because part of the deal is to discover who I am. So, okay, you don't want to read poetry? You're lost. No problem. I feel sorry for people who don't read poetry. Why would you not? Why would you not fire everything inside your brain? Why would you not just like, let explosions happen? Why would you not enjoy poetry? I, tell, I have the feeling that in this country, it's because we start with those terrible nursery rhymes. Huh? Like you learn nursery rhymes by heart. You don't even know what they mean. I'll ask everybody here, what is a tuffet? Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. What is a tuffet? We don't know. She sat on a tuffet eating her curds and whey. But really, you eat whey or you drink whey. Okay? There came a spider and sat on beside her and frightened Miss Muffet to be... Everybody learns this ridiculous poem mm -hmm. and says it in an air of terrible seriousness in some principal's office. And this will decide whether you get into school or not. Your first encounter with poetry is literally the Gestapo. <laughs> Do you understand? Do you know what this means? Tell me. <laughs> How you would love poetry after that? It's ridiculous what you write. Nursery rhymes have to be banned. 
and instead we have to do is just with the the this is the it's just like do rapping we have to scatting it's like create music tap on tables play with your fingers clap your hands teach children rhythm but don't teach them this this ridiculous nursery rhymes Amazing. That's the beginning of the end, I think, is in those nursery rhymes. If any of you become children, don't teach your children nursery rhymes. <laughs> teach them to dance. And when the principal says what nursery rhymes, you know, then tell the kid dance and start the music. <laughs> Let the kid dance. <laughs> self-expression through dance, tell the principal. Doesn't your school encourage self-expression? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so true. That's so true. <laughs> yeah. Any more, Neha? Any more questions? We've got a whole lot of comments, Jerry. Uh, thank you, sir. Yes, uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly ma'am, if you could unmute yourself, go ahead and please ask. Uh, good, e uh, good evening, sir. Good uh, evening, huh? uh, huge admirer, sir, first of all. And thank you so much for uh, these beautiful readings. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm uh, based out of Chandigarh, and I am sure the next time I'm visiting Mumbai, I'd be only thinking of maybe finding an opportunity to meet you. Uh, sir, um, it's uncanny that you mention, you know, uh, the need of carnal connectedness between hands and paper, because I've come fresh from a conference where everybody was hamming about digital poetry and uh, interactive poetry. And I want to know your take on that, because I'm a bit of an old school conservative when it comes to poetry. And we've grown up on, uh, you know, definitions of people like Keats who say that it better come like leaves on a tree or it or it better not come at all. So what is your take on uh, the old experimental poetry in the digital space? I personally feel the aesthetics are terribly compromised uh, in that space. Uh, I just want to know your views about that. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, no, no, uh, absolutely no problem. I'm, uh, uh, I'm all for anything anyone wants to do, if they want to do it. You know what I mean? I'm, and my whole, my whole thing is freedom. Okay, like my thing is, you like to go out onto the internet and you like to uh, put up a poem and you like to judge your poem by how many likes it gets and all. Go do it. Enjoy. It. Have fun. Okay, not a problem. Okay, I'm fine with that. Right? I got no issues with it. And I see when I was young, people would write poetry on bathroom walls. <laughs> <laughs> they would write, like, I mean, you know, there were, I don't know if anyone has autograph books anymore, but we used to have autograph books where there was poetry written in autograph books. Poetry turns up in the most odd places, and it's often, um, see, it's okay. Where I am comfortable is when I am sitting with a book of poetry and reading from paper. Does that mean I have any right to tell Meher Nisa Siddiqui who is here uh, that she should not go on the internet and look, uh, look, up, look at poems there? No. She may and may find pleasure in it. Then that's fine with me. I, I have no issues. I don't. Okay, That's something to do maybe with me. So I'm not going to judge for other people. Uh, and be, uh, when, I, when I say this, my young friends uh, say to me, but you miss out on a lot. You, know? you miss out on some good poetry. And I say, yes. But in everything we are missing out, right? I have, like, I mean, a, in a given year, maybe 300 books of poetry come out in, in India. And I maybe only buy about 150 of them. The other 150 I don't even see because distribution is always a problem in this country. So when you go to other cities, you always go to bookshops and you say, what's the poetry that you have? And they often don't even have poetry. It's so very depressing and sad, but okay, Jan, that's the way life is. It's not a problem. Um, but would I say, therefore, that, uh, that uh, poetry on the internet or poetry on Instagram or poetry on Twitter is not to be trusted? I think I gave you the answer when I said, go out and buy books of poetry. <laughs> but that's, again, like, I mean, 57-year-old Buddha is going to say that to you. So don't be too, like... Uh, don't, don't get taken in by that. But what I'd say is, for myself, I'd say I'm not, I'm not, a, even my Instagram account, which is Mahim Kajeti, uh, is, uh, is not, I don't do poetry on it. I do, I, I talk a little about, uh, about my experiences with writing and what I have learned with writing. And that's what I offer. As a I, I find um, these are visual mediums, really. Instagram especially is a visual medium. And therefore, uh, I'm not sure how I'm not sure how I would be I would process 
uh, poetry on Instagram. It doesn't mean that it's wrong or bad or anything. In 50 years' time, maybe poetry on Instagram will be like the way to go. And we'll look at that also. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you, sir, for uh, mm. that wonderful answer. Uh, Deepa mm. has a question. She can yeah. her hand. Yeah. Go, Deepa. Uh, one of the things I'm discovering as I'm growing old is um, I can speak three languages comfortably, English, Hindi, and Tamil, which is my mother tongue. Uh, my mother reads and writes in Tamil very fluently, so she shares poetry with me. And I find that poems written a hundred years ago uh, do not express sentiments very different from what we are going through, especially as we grow old and the cycle of catches up parents, teenage kids, and so on. Everybody has had the same problems. So for me, poetry is a uh, proof that no matter how much life changes, it's still the same. That human beings are still the same. There's the same amount of good stuff even across the world. Uh, is that a very simplistic view of what, it gives me a sense of comfort that everything changes, but everything stays the same. What would be your reaction to that? I think what uh, I think I completely agree with you, Deepa. In general, I think everything remains the same and everything changes dramatically. I think you know if you read uh, uh, read the poems of Ovid or you read the poems of Horace, they seem to be saying very much the same as as what uh, you know, like uh, the poems of uh, of some young people today saying sometimes very nasty things about other other poets and stuff like that. Uh, but what really the only thing that changes is the human being who is writing the new poem and the human being who is receiving the new poem. Those are the two things that change. Because they keep changing, therefore poetry keeps changing. So poetry will always refresh itself because people become different. People receive poetry differently. People transmit poetry differently. That's how, that's how it changes. Otherwise, pretty much, I mean, I think Mark Twain once said in, in 1875, if I'm not wrong, all the stories have been told. There, there are no new stories. So then the question then arises, why do we get still 10 stories? There are so many brilliant stories around. Like, you know, the Mahabharat, the recent translation of the Mahabharat by Dr. Vivek Debroy is 10 volumes. That will take you about a two or three years to read. And by the time you've come to the end of it, you'll have forgotten the beginning and you could start again and read it again. There's, there's no need for any more books. There's enough books to keep us all all going for the rest of our lives. So then why do we write? We write because there's a book inside us. There's a poem inside us. That poem needs to get out. And when that poem comes out, is written, it finds its reader because there was a need for that poem and that reader. This is what we believe in. This is our faith. This is our optimism. All writers, however deranged and however uh, depressed, are basically optimists because when we commit to words to paper, we commit ourselves to the possibility of a reader in the future, the possibility of human communication being, being alive and real. That's what we commit. We commit to hope. Yeah? Thank you. My pleasure. Anyone else? Uh, thank you, sir. There are some uh, notes of appreciation as well. Those were not asked questions, but uh, Dr. Supan Bhattacharya, who interacted with you, says that was such a profound uh, thought provoking session, and you expressed your thoughts very lucidly, especially to a couple of uh, questions that he asked. Uh, also, Neha Mehra, who uh, inquired earlier, she says, uh, Thank you for uh, you know, a truly grateful session. It was a wonder to listen to uh, Mr. Pinto. And uh, there's Dr. Francis Banerjee, who also says that, uh, uh, you know, this session made him uh, sort of re-read and chew poetry uh, with uh, all of us. And Lovely. listening to you has been such a treat uh, for him as well. Uh, sir, if you don't mind, I have a question. I am Neha, faculty uh, at the Department of English uh, So you spoke about, uh, you spoke about how uh, in the process of poetry, one has to uh, be sort of bear oneself and be ready to be vulnerable. Uh, so how taxing is it for the poet to bounce back to normalcy? Or is it that a chunk of uh, the poet always is missing after a particularly 
uh, robust or uh, sort of uh, thought provoking poem that the poet has written? I think the answer to that is a statistical answer. Uh, the suicide rate is highest among poets. Hmm. <laughs> because uh, I, I do write some poetry in my mother tongue in yes. Marathi. And sometimes, uh, yeah, no, I, mean, and some... I think I really think poetry is, is a high risk occupation. Yeah. Uh, and in this time, it's even more high risk for reasons that we all are aware of. But more than anything, it is because uh, of the amount of vulnerability and the exposure, the self-exposure that, that happens. And so self-care becomes even more important. So I'm, when I'm saying be careful, I'm actually just saying take care of yourself. Okay, Like yeah. we uh, in, in, in the act of creating poetry, um, sometimes think of it as like, icebergs hiving, like, you know, big chunks of the iceberg falling off into the sea. Um, but uh, but if, we, if, we, if we actually act, okay, this is the thing I say to everybody when I'm talking about these things is that there is no one thing that one can do uh, for mental health. It's a lot of choices that have to be made. It's about sleeping well. It's about eating well. It's about exercising well. It's about staying positive. It's about doing some yoga, doing some, some having some physical exercise, having a routine. It's about connecting with humanity, connecting with people, you know, working, working with people, uh, with having good friends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All those are choices that we have to make. And uh, then poetry can be a part of that glorious enjoyment of, of words and language and doesn't have to be therefore harmful or hurtful. Equally, there are many poets who kill themselves, many poets who live long and comfortable and happy lives. But I think it is those poets who take care of themselves that manage that. So I would say that really if you're doing poetry, it is a high risk occupation. But, and so take care of yourself. Uh, someone has asked, are there any other genres that I anything, anything that has to do with language, and I'm your man. <laughs> so I read poetry, I read prose, I read fiction, I read short stories, I read plays, I read, I read anything. I'll read, I'll read if I'm, I'm stuck and I, I don't have a book to, uh, to, uh, to keep me going, I'll read, uh, I'll read the back of an of a, of a detergent box. I'll read the instructions on a, on a manual. I'll read. For me, words are important. Someone else asked about whether poets are attached to their words that they generate. Of course we are. Of course we are attached to the words we generate. If uh, if someone says that's a bad poem, poets. If someone says your poetry is not very good, poets. Somewhere fundamentally, because this is the essential part of you that you've taken and you've kind of converted into a poem. So yes, you're attached to them. But no, you're not, not going to be so attached to them that you're um, that uh, you're not going to be able to work with them, right? So when you the first flood of right of words comes in and and pours down onto the paper, and you're feeling so good about the fact that this looks and feels like a poem, and this would be this 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 this, and then you have to actually settle down and say, okay, yeah, but how can I make this into a poem? This is this is just this is the atha. I need to roll my rotis now. I need to fry them. There are many steps. So then comes the editing, the looking, the working with rhythm, the working with, with thinking about, is this the correct word? For instance, a poem I just read by a friend had a word called blinker. He said, we had, um, you would like me to wear a blinker. And I immediately thought, no, it has to be blinkers. Blinkers are two. They block off your sight so you can't see anything. If I have one blinker, I can see pretty much everything. But that doesn't work. Okay, so I sat, said that to him and he said, no, I'm reinventing language. I feel it is, I can say a blinker. I thought, okay, fine. I told you what I thought. Now it's your poem. You can, you can, you can keep the blinker. When I saw the poem in print, I saw that there were blinkers. I thought, okay, great. Blink. Like someone listened a little. <laughs> but sometimes they don't. And sometimes, you know, but uh, fundamentally being attached to your words is, I think that Philip Gustin's story about leaving the room is the important thing. Eventually, 
if this has to become a part of the world of words, it will only carry two words on it that have anything to do with you. Jerry Pinto at the end, right? As the writer. But the greatest success of a poem is when the poem floats free of the author. When it is now just anchemic, okay? So Narayan Survey, a great Marathi poet, has uh, uh, a lovely poem called Dhongra Chakhet, which is uh, my, my, uh, my field on a hill. And he says that, you know, often women pulling water will sing this song as they're pulling water and they don't even know it's his anymore. And that is like also huge. That's really, really like, that's, that's the Nobel Prize being given to you by a woman standing at a well who has taken your words and, and loosed them from you, broken your attachment to them and made them her own because they expressed the agony of drawing water to climb up a, and then pour it on a, on a, a hilly farm. How beautiful is that? Not happened to me yet. We can hope. As I said, writers are optimists. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jerry. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yes, Rashmi says detached but attached. I have a question, Jerry. When can you take a, a, writer, a poetry writing workshop for us? Sure, anytime you say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to yeah. hold you to that. Absolutely. Okay, try. It's been, it's been absolutely Can it be a hybrid workshop? <laughs> we could try. Yeah. Let's see. If yeah. it's a possible on. online, wonderful. Otherwise, we welcome you to Nagpur at any time, Deepa. I used to come to Nagpur lots when I was a child. I had family in Nagpur in the railways. Oh, so yeah. I used to come to the lines lots and lots of time. I had okay. great fun at Seminary Hill. Oh. Enjoyed the cause ice cream, yes. chocolate ball mat. <laughs> you have to come. You have to come once again. We'll call okay. you. We'll have something. We'll yeah. have some coming. Um, yes. Okay. Um, if there are no more questions, any comments? Because then we but have to. Acharya sir is commenting that he doesn't have words to express his gratitude, oh. and one of the most enriching sessions that has he's ever been part of. Thank you so much. How kind of you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just one last word. Uh, yeah. For what it's worth, turn the enrichment into a daily affair. In the sense that, you know, uh, one of the things that I do is I make anthologies of my own. Whenever I find a poem that I really like, I print it out or I cut it out and I stick it into a, into a notebook, an old notebook, and I make anthologies. So collect and save the poems that you love and make an anthology of your own. Enjoy reading it from time to time. We can all be anthologists. We can all create like lovely bouquets of poetry and return to them from time to time. Thank you all so much. Stay with Hood. Bye. So one minute, Jerry. We'd just like yeah. to have a small a formal vote of thanks to formally conclude the program. And then just two minutes, Neha, I think is going to be a vote of thanks. And then we're done. Thank okay. you, everyone, for participating on my behalf and from the college's side. Of course, Neha is going to be doing a formal job. But uh, thank you so much for attending in such large numbers. We were overwhelmed with participation. And um, yeah, over to you, Neha. Simply stunning. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I don't think thanks is a big enough word to mm. encompass what all of us are feeling right now. But nevertheless, uh, uh, I would uh, like to express a formal vote of thanks. Uh, sir, on behalf of the Department of English at LAD and Srimati RP College for Women, uh, I express a deep sense of gratitude for a most enthralling and insightful session on uh, what uses poetry. I'm sure all of us today are going to go home with lots of food for thought. And as you said, are going to make an anthology or at least a scrapbook for ourselves of our most beloved poems. Uh, uh, on behalf of the department, I would like to extend my gratitude to our uh, management for their continued support and encouragement to all of our initiatives, to Dr. Pooja Pathak, Madam, Principal, LAD College, uh, for her encouragement and constant support. I would also like to uh, take this opportunity in thanking Dr. Rudha Dharmadikari, Head Department of English, for her uh, constant initiative and pushing all of us to keep doing something new uh, when it comes to literature. 
the staff of uh, our department, English department, for their tireless efforts in making the third Kamla Narayanan Memorial Lecture such a rousing success. Um, and last but not the least, our participants from all parts of life, from scholars to researchers to academicians themselves, poets, <laughs> and from Nagpur and abroad as well. Thank you so much for joining us today and being such patient listeners. You have really given us a boost to start working immediately for the fourth Kamla Narayanan Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much. I propose uh, the session to have concluded. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. All. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sreeja, also, who's been our technical yes. support. Uh, thank without you, thank her, you so much, ma'am. My pleasure. Sreeja has been a huge, huge support. She's been the... She's a massive, the... massive thank you to LED College for organizing this. <laughs> Absolutely. You've raised, you so really raised, so raised the bar. Really raised the bar. Thank you so much. Thank you.